The AWARE Project's aim is to balance the public conversation about psychedelics, spread accurate information, and give a new face to psychedelia. We feel that this change will occur through connection and relationship, one individual at a time. We are calling on everyone whose lives have been improved through the mindful use of psychedelics to educate themselves and become ambassadors for the psychedelic experience. Show those around you that people who use psychedelics mindfully cross all social, racial, economic, and political boundaries. Uh, this is um, AWARE Project. You're here for the AWARE Project Psychedelic Salon. My name is Cherie Malcolm Vidassi. I'm a psychedelic pictures. integration coach, and I'm co producing the event tonight with AWARE Project. The, uh, or, uh, the organizer and founder of AWARE Project, Ashley Booth, is not here currently. She's partying in Oregon in a festival, having a great time. But she's sending her love. So we'll, um, we'll just hold down the house for her and have a great time for everyone. Um, well, I don't even know where to begin. I'm a little nervous, a little excited. Uh, very excited because our guest tonight is here all the way from Colorado. This is his first time in Los Angeles. And his presence here just happened so fast that I think we're all a little bit overwhelmed by it. Um, and just really glad that we could make this happen in sh such a short amount of time. So thank you for being a part of making this evening happen. Um, as some of you know, we're a project host a series of bi-monthly salons. So we have events in San Diego and downtown LA and here, but we bring in different speakers to speak about current psychedelic topics. And um, as you can see, we have an awesome crowd and a lot of people come here who have been coming regularly for about two years. So, you know, this wouldn't exist without you guys. So thanks again. And as a psychedelic integration coach, which is another organization that we have here in Los Angeles. I host uh, integration groups and integration workshops and shamanic practices workshops that also pertain to psychedelic substances, but also um, help introduce cool people over on here. the practical <laughs> side and help support people in the process of either preparing or integrating previous experiences. So it's more about emotional support. So that's a little bit about what I do. As a disclaimer, you guys know that again, we're here for educational purposes and to learn something new. This is not a place, of course, to seek illegal substances, try to sell them, um, or engage. You know, so please don't arrive on any psychedelic substances, don't try to seek them out, don't try to sell them, and let's keep our space uh, for entertainment purposes only and for educational purposes only so we can keep us all safe. And um, yeah, let's read our bio for tonight's speaker. Daniel McQueen. Um, he is the executive director of Medicinal Mindfulness and the principal, principal organizer for the Medicinal Mindfulness Extended State DMT Research Project. He's a transformational coach and psychedelic facilitator using cannabis sativa, mindfulness practices, and advanced breathwork techniques. He facilitates monthly community conscious cannabis circles, cannabis healing meditations, community breath work, as well as private sessions. So Daniel pretty much does what Ashley and myself and a few other psychedelics, like Brad, Brad Adams is here tonight, who's also the leader of LAMPS, Los Angeles Medicinal Plant Society, who also has monthly groups. So Daniel does pretty much what the three of us do together. So there's a lot of appreciation for that, I think. And um, so he teaches psychedelic facilitators training program called Psychedelic Sitter School. He is currently developing an applied psychonautics training program to train volunteer psychonauts for future extended state DMT research. And is working with a team of researchers to develop an advanced healing protocol using cannabis and breath work for the treatment of PTSD and trauma. I wrote all that. So without further ado, the introduction of the talk title is Manifesting Vision of Extended State DMT and Trans Cannabis Research. I'd like to present to you Mr. Daniel McQueen. Yeah. <laughs> thank you, Sue. Thank you. All right, thank you so much, everyone. That was, that was wonderful. I've never, uh, well, I actually have been described as having an overwhelming presence, so um, it's not the first time I've heard that. I apologize for, for being so intense. Um, but, but, you know, there, we follow the threads. Uh, we follow... Uh, the signs and uh, 
LA was in my field for six months or so. A lot of people kept popping up from your community and I got learning more and more about what was going on here. And I was like, wow, this is really great. I should check this out. And then, uh, um, what, you know, when would the opportunity show up? And then it just ha so happens that my, um, my wife's uh, uh, mother uh, has turned 60, turned 60 this week, and they were having a party out here, so we decided to just go for it, come out and, and uh, introduce ourselves. Um, so my whole family's here. I got to introduce the ocean to my four-year-old and one-year-old, and that was a lovely experience today. So um, it's a great space. Thank you so much for the, such a warm welcome, Shereen. Um, <laughs> And I want to also thank Ashley for helping set this up. I, I'm disappointed that she couldn't make it, but I totally understand this is completely last minute. So I'm really grateful for you all to be here. Uh, I want to also acknowledge Preston in the back here, Lopez. He's a, a transformational coach and um, <laughs> been through our sitter school. Uh, so he's a sitter for our program. And um, Marissa, where did I, did I get that right? Um, she helped with all the social media uh, and getting you all here. So I'm really grateful for that. I know how much work it takes to facilitate uh, events like this. And so um, uh, thank you very much for, uh, for doing this with me. Um, we had a little bit of a glitch with the, uh, with the PowerPoint. I'm not showing my notes on the screen, but I got it on my phone. So, um, so if I'm looking at something over here, just bear with me. I wanna, I, I'm not going to read anything. I just want to make sure I'm not missing some important points. Um, So before I begin the talk, I want to acknowledge uh, the privilege that I hold and that, um, that I'm in a very privileged position to be able to speak openly about this work and that it is uh, based on my privilege that I'm able to do this. Um, you know, I live in Boulder, Colorado, very, uh, a very progressive place in some ways. So there's, there's only, well, not many places I could do the work that I do. Uh, but I also want to name that I'm speaking as, uh, as someone who identifies as a medicine person. And what that means is not a medicine guide or medicine man or anything like that. A medicine person in my world represents someone who uses uh, psychedelics and cannabis intentionally to improve their lives. It's a way of life. Uh, and that it's been a stepping out process um, to get used to this level of exposure and um, and that, uh, and so I'm here to represent a community that is uh, one of the few communities in America that's left that can be incarcerated for practicing religious beliefs and, uh, you know, deeply held spiritual and religious beliefs. It's so marginalized that we don't even identify it as a community. Um, and that we've experienced these, uh, you know, as we bring this program out into the world. Um, we just call it turbulence and keep going, you know. Um, but I, I wanted to acknowledge the, that privilege piece before I begin. Uh, I also want to name that I'm a, a regular cannabis user, you know, and uh, I'm very, uh, I mean, it's what I do for a living, teach people how to smoke pot, right? So, <laughs> you know, it's just the best job I've ever had. Uh, I mean, really. Um, so there's a lot of privilege there too, you know, I feel so fortunate that this is my full-time job. I started Medicinal Mindfulness uh, through our counseling program in 2012 and uh, we've been facilitating cannabis circles for almost four years. Uh, and so half, I tell people half my job is helping facilitate psychedelic experiences using breathwork and cannabis and the other half of my job is helping people cope with the consequences of using breathwork and cannabis because of the big transitions that occur, you know, that are, you're required. So it's like, oh shit, now that I know that about myself, what do I have to do? Uh, that, or that job no longer serves me or, or whatever. So, so the other half of my job is sitting with people and helping them uh, navigate that transition in, in the world. Uh, so I, I really sincerely believe I have one of the best jobs on the planet. Um, I'd like to request that this presentation be treated uh, like expedition notes you know so like I've been out traveling exploring new possibilities and not expedition notes necessarily as um, ex psychedelic experience expeditions but actually manifesting and engaging in a ongoing uh, psychedelic inspired program for the last 
Uh, I mean, uh, how long have I been on this journey? I, I've been, a, um, I can, I, since for about 20 years, you know, I've been, I've been doing work intentionally with these medicines. Uh, it's been the last four years, really, that we've engaged in uh, cannabis and breath work. Um, so this is more of like, here's my notebook of the journey, you know, like uh, the log, the travel log that I've been on. And so, so I can't, I don't have time to go into all the details of everything that I want to talk about today. It's, it's not long enough uh, of a time, but um, feel free to ask me questions that are important to you. Okay, afterwards or in person or start an email conversation. I'm happy to, I'm happy to engage and play with you in this space. Um, we're also, our program's also going through a primary metamorphosis, and this is why I picked this butterfly image, um, that I didn't know what was happening this summer. I thought it was just going to be a normal summer. Uh, but we started to step into some possibilities that were real game changers. And it looks like we're stepping more into research, and we're stepping out of doing our, some of our ongoing tra uh, classes and things, more trainings, more retreats and things. So I'm still fresh out of the chrysalis. Uh, my wings are drying, and so I'm still kind of looking around. And so this is this is kind of based on what um, what I'm seeing so far, as opposed to I know everything that I'm talking about. Um, it's more of a uh, ex exploration, an expedition. But I'd like to start by uh, sharing a story that I shared at the last uh, one of my last presentations, and that's the story of Ic Icarus and Daedalus. And I'm gonna I'm gonna abbreviate the heck out of it. But uh, Daedalus, this is ancient Greek, was an inventor, and he was so good at what he did that people didn't like him. So they stuck him on an island with his son Icarus. Well, Icarus or Daedalus was an inventor, and so he used seagull feathers and wax from a candle and made these wings. And he said, "Okay, Icarus, here we go. We're going to escape this island. Don't fly too high because the your wings will melt and you'll die. Don't fly too low." and your uh, wings will get wet and you'll die. Just fly straight ahead, follow me. Uh, well, what did Icarus do? He saw the light, he was mesmerized by it and flew straight up for it. And his wings melted and he died. And Daedalus was sad. Um, sometimes our elders, though, clip our wings to keep us safe. So we fly straight. And the problem with that is this, this is a psychedelic community. That's never gonna happen. The, the straight and narrow path, the parallel path, staying in this middle world, isn't the path that we're choosing to take, right? And so what's required is maybe something about upgrading our metaphor, that we're not ancient Greek, we are in 2017, and we can play with metaphors of, uh, that promote and support resilience, so we can fly higher, or skillful practices. So we can fly higher for a little bit and come down before our wings melt, but you know, things like that. Uh, but we also want to name that there's maybe psychedelic metaphors that we can live into as well, and that is the island is an illusion. So, and the, and the work is turning within, right? So we're working these pretty big, and complex, higher dimensional experiences. So we need better tools and we need better paradigms, mindsets, ways of thinking about this for it to really work for us. Uh, and one of the things that when we start playing with that idea of what really works for us, we start developing wings that have a little more capacity than old feathers and wax, is we start to realize that there's other places we can explore and discover. Right? And so what is that? And then now that we know that that's possible, it's how do we bring that into the world? That's a whole other question, right? Uh, and so this is, this is the path that we've been playing with and exploring. And I hope to inspire and uh, make you curious. And I'm not, I, I, this is a psychedelic community, so um, I don't expect you to always agree with me, right? We, we are very complex, individualistic, and very creative and smart. And that um, I learn, the reason I do this is because it seems to be required for me to learn, right? And from you and, and, and putting myself in this position forces me to step into it and really try to explain what it is we're doing. 
So one of the maps that we play with is what we call the psychedelic compass. And I haven't really seen this anywhere. You know, I, I don't know if it's 100% original. Um, but it's a holistic orientation. What we play with is that there's four primary uh, paradigms that people do medicine work in. Religious, spiritual, ayahuasca, Native American church, non-traditional ceremonies is in the east of the medicine wheel. This is based on a Native American teaching of the medicine wheel. The west would be more psychological exploration, healing, trauma, right? MDMA for PTSD, that sort of thing. There's a huge uh, focus in the north right now, scientific inquiry, discovery, problem solving. But we use these medicines for that purpose, right? And in the south, uh, this is like festivals, celebrations, play, art, music, that sort of thing. And then I just added grassroots activism for this presentation because I really think that's in the South. But authentic presence. And, and each one has a shadow and a gift. And if you consider like spiritual bypassing as a shadow in the East, never being grounded, never being in the present in the material world, it can be balanced out by its opposite. Psychological, inquiry, trauma healing, resolution. Um, the egoism of the North, right? Big heady, I know what I'm talking about. Kind of uh, rigid, structured. It's balanced out by creativity in the play in the South. Creativity, play, right? Festivals, right? There's a lot of stuff that goes harm that happens at festivals. It's balanced out by having education and skill and knowledge. It's called something called, that we call psychedelic harm reduction now. Right? So when we incorporate a larger model that's holistic, we can see how they support and help each other. And we can go deeper in our process. So this is one of our primary tenets of medicinal mindfulness is that um, uh, we're more a holistic. We're not trying to um, say we're better, we just uh, like, or one is better than the other, but they're all required. They're also not mutually exclusive. You know, the Native American church ceremony, I mean, this is what this is based off of, Native American ceremony and uh, traditions is, um, is a good example of something that's a holistic model that holds all of it. So I'm not a typical research scientist. I'm talking about research, but I'm using a very radical definition of that. And I, uh, I'm more of a community organizer. And so when we identify these four primary paradigms, there are archetypes that we can live in too. So I identify as a healer explorer. And I just added the uh, alchemist part. This is something I'm really trying to own in myself. You know, it's kind of new agey, but I'm, uh, I'd rather be identified as an alchemist than a shaman, right? I don't, I don't think that's appropriate for me to use labels like that. Um, so, uh, you know, and, and also alchemy is a very important part of our process. And then the artist activist, you know, really owning the activism piece as part of the South as well. Um, I do this for a living. I've been doing it full time for the last four or so years. I transitioned out of being a therapist. I no longer identify as a therapist so that uh, I don't have to deal with the, oh, you're a therapist giving drugs to your clients issue. Yeah. Right, that's, you know, like it's, cannabis is still a schedule one substance on the federal level and, and uh, you know, it's gonna take probably, I don't know how long, a decade or more before we're able to really re realign that. But people are working on that. Uh, and I come with, I do have a clinical background now, so I, I really own that piece as a tool that I use to stay safe and keep people safe. I come from a transpersonal orientation. I graduated from Naropa University, which is a Buddhist-based, um, you know, psychology counseling program, so very mindfulness based. And then I come from a community organizing approach. And, you know, like healing occurs in community. Um, another primary medicinal mindfulness principle that we work with is reorienting of the idea of set and setting to incorporate a third uh, dimension called skill which is a simple concept, but it's not something that we really talk about that much. Um, sorry, I'm kind of in the front of it. Maybe I can come over here. Um, but this is a shadow piece of our movement in that we think we can just take a medicine and, uh, and it'll fix us. And uh, it we lose our agency, in a sense, by not engaging it. 
so we added this idea of skill set to incorporate uh, like a conversation around uh, the idea that everything that we experience in a psychedelic uh, a state or a way of being is something that can be developed uh, and that resilience can be developed. So you can develop a stronger and stronger ability to engage uh, strong um, extreme emotional responses. So oh, I'm experiencing terror right now. Okay, let me breathe with that. I'm going to stay with it and something big happens. But if you don't have a strong resilience to terror, uh, then maybe you're going to run away from it or disengage it, right? So if you can develop these, this idea of skill sets that can be incorporated, engaged, and practiced, then we have more agency in the psychedelic experience. Uh, And what we're finding is that it makes a big difference, you know, in people's experiences. So what I do is I, uh, instead of saying, okay, rely on the guide to be your guide, uh, here are some skill sets that you can use with breath work or cannabis that mimic what MDMA does naturally. And so you can incorporate mindfulness practices with cannabis to have MDMA-like experiences. Um, and what, what does those do? They heal trauma, right? So, uh, so there's skill sets in healing trauma that we can teach people how to do instead of relying on a therapist to, to do so. What time did we get started? How much time do I have? Okay. So Colorado legalized recreational cannabis in 2014. Uh, so I, as soon as it became legal, we started facilitating circles. And so I've been experimenting with these practices for about four years now, incorporating a lot of what I learned in other uh, modalities from mindfulness, working with maps, and um, working with shamanic practitioners and other things into this program. We, we do what we call community breath work, conscious cannabis circles. We have a program called Psychedelic Sitter School, and then we have a program like this program, uh, the AWARE program, uh, project, um, we call Psychedelic Shine. Uh, we're, the edges that we're exploring right now is incorporating this little CA here represents cannabis-assisted breath work. So we're incorporating specific blends with uh, smoking specific blends uh, and then doing a breath work practice see what that does, and it's pretty evocative. It's the newest part of our program, but pretty amazing. Uh, so this is how our identity shows up in the real world. And Boulder is very different than here, you know. Um, uh, and, we've, and because of the laws and how the regulations happen, we've been able to use the recreational cannabis laws, which you all are just about to step into, to incorporate therapeutic uses and in, uh, intentional uses of psychedelics. What I want to say, though, is that we are migrating to a global psychedelic paradigm. Things are changing so quickly, and it's getting very weird out there. I don't know if you've noticed. And uh, <laughs> what better way to deal with the world than to use psychedelics? Um, <laughs> and I believe cannabis and breath work and uh, engaging these tools at this time is the best way to practice the skill sets that we're going to need to have a sustainable psychedelic society, right? We don't have to wait for legalization to happen before we can start living a psychedelic society. And that's what I thought about when we started medicinal mindfulness, is what can we do right now, right? Mm -hmm. Not in the future. Uh, and then what would that mean? It would be we live into the possibility of a future psychedelic society where it's fully supported so I imagine some things like the Google Lunar X Prize for psychedelics, $30 million to put a little thing on the moon and move it around a little bit and take some pictures. That would cover the whole MAPS phase three study, right? Uh -huh. <clears throat> but to do that, we have to acknowledge that there's a huge shadow in our movement, that we're not perfect. Uh, we do have the capacity to look at our shadow more than other people do because of our use of medicines, but that doesn't mean we do. And that with every innovation of psychedelics or altered states, there are really big consequences to them. You know, I would say Einstein was in an altered state when he invented E equals MC squared. That leads to nuclear bombs. LSD led to Prozac, things like that. 
Uh, so we really want to acknowledge this so we can manage it and also might manage the power that we're playing with. This is 2017, and uh, this is a new article by Alicia Danforth, which I think is really appropriate. It's kind of like the ethical questions of how we advertise these medicines and how subjects are treated in research to, for funding and things like that. I would recommend checking it out. Uh, there's more you know, cracks forming around us as we step out of the shadows. And so we want to pay attention to these issues. And I definitely do because I've, you know, I do interviews and things and I read the article and I'm like, oh shit, that was interesting. But uh, Gaia TV is about to do a, uh, do a series on psychedelics that we're a part of uh, called Psychedelica. And so it's starting to hit the mainstream in, uh, on television and things. And I'm really excited about this project. So I wanted to, you to check it out. Gaia TV is going to have as much of the psychedelic content that's available in one resource. Uh, and so if we can make that successful, then there will be funding for more and more content that's psychedelic related. But here's an example of one of the uh, articles, one of the original articles. It's a very sensational. We're not really building a DMT machine. <laughs> and uh, I can't, I'm, uh, we are kind of wanting to talk to aliens though. Um, but it, it really actually led to a lot of people connecting, you know, it went viral and uh, I was able to connect with other people and who are interested in this work. And then this was the one that we did that came out after uh, Andrew Gallimore, Dr. Andrew Gallimore came to speak to Psychedelic Shine. You know, I'm always hesitant to read these things that, you know, it's like I'm very vulnerable and uh, sensitive energetically to, uh, to you know, these experiences, you know, so what does it mean to step up as a psychedelic activist into this limelight, right? Again, it's a skill set that you can develop. And, uh, you know, I encourage you to develop it before jumping too deep into it because it's a big experience for us. Um, before we talk about DMT, though, I want to talk a little bit more of the so uh, social context and then uh, some, some, uh, uh, on uh, cannabis, uh, but you know this mainstreaming of psychedelics is, a, is like a buzzword. Uh, I'm sure we've all heard that or seen that. And and then another way people are describing it, a uh, researcher that I talked to is the prozacification. It's like you're having a required purpose for it to be legitimate. So I fully support microdosing and using these medicines for trauma healing and that sort of thing. But to have our identity based on usefulness. Um, doesn't feel right to me. It's also important that we mainstream these medicines in a way that don't continue to marginalize the people who are marginalized by the mainstream, right? So there's some big issues that are, people are starting to talk about now. This is a great article that just came out by Dr. J. Sevelius. Um, you know, this is things that I've been paying attention to for a little while now, and I would really encourage you to read it. Um, but here's a quote, this lack of humility will be Western psychedelic science's primary barrier to achieving one of its ultimate goals, which is to develop medicines and therapies that are available and generalizable to as many people as possible. That's exactly what, let me go back to that. This is exactly what we're trying to do with medicinal mindfulness is using these medicines in a way that's generalizable, that can be used on a large scale for as much healing as possible. I don't know if you noticed again, but we, as a society, we need a little bit of support in that area. Um, there's a lot of fear happening right now. It's the war on drugs is back. Will psychedelic drug research survive? And to me, this is very non-issue. Uh, I really mean that. If you let's call let's call their names, Trump and Session, you know, and all the crazy shit that's happening, they're so dysfunctional, and they have so many other issues that maybe this is more of an opening for psychedelic work than uh, the possibility of it being shut down, right? And that it's oh maybe it's okay that we start thinking outside the box a little bit, that we don't have to stay to the status quo to out of fear of losing our capacity to do this research. 
I have a feeling that our community will last longer than the Trump sessions um, agenda, you know? <laughs> and, it beca and here's another example, you know, uh, why can't we do um, voter, vote, you know, votes, um, state initiatives to legalize other psychedelics? We've done it with cannabis already, and now they're starting to talk about uh, uh, psilocybin mushrooms in Oregon. Let's talk about some trans cannabis research. Oops. So cannabis sativa, did you know it was a psychedelic? Cannabis is a very powerful medicine, but she's super humble, and she let herself be demonized, ridiculed, degraded to the point where she was only considered a recreational drug like alcohol, right? It was a spell she put on the whole, the whole nation, right? I don't think they would have let her be legalized if they knew what we could do with her. So we all had to forget we had to forget, so we all played the game, we played along, yeah, let's treat it like recreational drug, like, uh, and like out regulate it like alcohol. And then after, before it became legal, right before it became legal in Colorado, a friend of mine said, you know, have you ever considered doing sessions, psychedelic sessions with cannabis? I said, what do you mean? <laughs> you know, and he said, well, you know, it is a psychedelic. I'm like, oh, yeah, yeah, that's right. Well, let's try it. So we started experimenting with it but nobody believes we can do what we can do. So it's a hard marketing pitch. Um, so I've been playing with this idea of renaming it trans cannabis. And this is really just an idea. I'm not even 100% sure about it. But this idea of trans meaning through and beyond, it's, it is cannabis, it's all just pot. Um, but there's something pretty powerful about it. What we're finding is that it can be used for trauma resolution and nervous system regulating. You know, for trauma healing, it just definitely can be used for that. And uh, also, though, creative problem solving. You get really great ideas on this when, when used in the right con context. And then resilience development. So it helps us be less traumatizable. <laughs> That's not quite a word, but does that make sense? We have more resilience so we're not traumatized in the future because we just have more space in our system. As medicine people, though, we can use it for a couple of other things, which is integration and intention development for other big experiences. I'm going through an ayahuasca experience. I want to prepare for it, so I'll sit with cannabis. Uh, and then also psychonautic skill development, which I'll explain in a second. Oh, this is the other thing that you can't do with any other psychedelics right now on a mass scale. We can hold, we've hold, held groups as much as 25 with cannabis so far. And the only reason we can't go bigger is because we don't have the space for it. Um, with breathwork, we've done groups of 90 or more. Um, but we can, ha you can have, you, we can create full psychedelic experiences with, with cannabis on a large scale. I mean, can you imagine, I'm sure there are I mean, the festivals and things, but you know how f wild those are. But imagine having a, psilocybin experience with 50 people and trying to contain that. What would that take? It would be quite a lot. So we can program the peak experience to be about an hour and a half to three hours. My favorite is 2.15, 2.30, two and a half hours. Mimics other medicines. Right now I'm playing with the idea that it's like psilocybin and MDMA combined. Or some people have more psilocybin-like experiences and others have more MDMA-like experiences. But if you have experience with ayahuasca or DMT, sometimes they, it reinitiates ayahuasca-like experiences or even DMT-like experiences. But the big difference is, is that if you take your eye covering off, you're going to be back. Whereas if you smoke DMT and you tried to come back, you really wouldn't, right? So there's a lot of agency. It's experienced a little slower than other medicines. So that means it's a little easier to navigate. And then the crazy piece is, is that skill set once developed on cannabis can be used on other medicines. Other medicines become easier to navigate. So uh, you can do more than just surrender to the experience. So what we're thinking about with this research idea is that a protocol can be developed using uh, 
these blends of cannabis that we do. Uh, breath work and cannabis assisted breath work to heal trauma and PTSD on a large scale and in group settings, which is a completely different paradigm than what uh, is being uh, offered around psychedelics. Um, the biggest questions that we have is how severe of a trauma can be treated. And, and you know, that's an interesting question. You know, we're talking like an acute, uh, severe PTSD uh, might still require a lot of support, but most of us don't have that. But we, we might not even qualify for clinically uh, significant PTSD, right? We might not have a diagnosis, but we can still have a lot of trauma that affects us, right? Uh, and so we can help, still help a lot of people even if we can't help uh, the trauma as much as MDMA or other medicines can. And then wh what are the necessary credentials for facilitators? Um, you know, to me, I like the idea of training as many people as possible, not requiring therapists or having a therapeutic background, but you still need therapeutic skills. And how quickly can we implement this on a large scale? This is the thing about this idea, though, is that we don't have to get FDA approval. We can start, we're already implementing it, right? We're already doing this work. We've been doing it for four years. And so it's a medicine that can be initiated now with the right um, intention, right? And the power behind it, the community power behind it. So one of the questions are, I often ask is, are we using psychedelics to heal trauma? Or are we using trauma to legalize psychedelics? And that has some serious ethical implications. So if we're using psychedelics to heal trauma, this would be a really good candidate because we need it now. We don't need it in 20 years on a large scale. Um, so we're already doing this work, but really the areas that we're, we're looking to develop now are alliances. And this is one of the reasons why I wanted to come out and speak to you is you know, this is beyond my capacity to hold as an individual human being at this point. Um, so we'll leave it at that, <laughs> right? Like, if you're interested in this work, please, please come talk to me. We are set up to receive funding. We're, a non, we're not a nonprofit, though. We are a for-profit corporation, so we're working to develop, like, business models and things to, in, to bring this into the world. But 90, 190 million people live in states where it's medically legal. That's 60% of the United States. So we believe that has some significance. So this is just one idea, is we create these buildings with a stage for live music and then a circle. And a 25 person, 50 person, and a 100 person capacity. So you imagine people laying on these are yoga mats. This is about the size of a human being right here. And that this is, this is actually feasible. We could facilitate groups this size right now with the community that, of trained facilitators, facilitators that we have. We wouldn't facilitate a whole community, 100 people with PTSD or trauma, right, in, in a situation like this because that hasn't been developed yet. That's our edge. But we can facilitate this right now. And here's another layout of it. I just think they're really cool. They look like little spaceships. <laughs> right? So the idea, and then, and then we have the infrastructure developed now so that when psilocybin becomes legal or MDMA becomes legal, we just put it right into the program. And the smaller buildings become the space for larger medicines or the research, the DMT research. So that's cannabis. That's just, that's one thing we're doing. And uh, the reason it's important to talk about cannabis is because it's needed. Uh, I don't think I could step into extended state DMT research without having a foundation of cannabis, the experiences and education that I've gotten. But also I think DMT research is pretty elitist, right? Um, it's very selective small numbers of people not there to necessarily heal the world, although I think it has the potential to create incredible technological breakthroughs. So, so I offer cannabis to people as my calling. I'm deeply inspired by it, but what I found is it wasn't inspiring enough for the psychedelic community. 
why do cannabis when I can do blank? Ayahuasca, DMT, um, psilocybin mushrooms, LSD, right? Uh, it doesn't make a lot of sense, to, you know, like why, why do it that way? So I started thinking, what would really inspire the psychedelic community? If we didn't have to focus on healing trauma, if we could be ourselves, if we could just be explorers, playful, what would that look like? And I started thinking about Rick Strassman's work with TNT in this article that I read. But this is a quote from Terence McKenna. What we experience in the presence of DMT is real news. It is a nearby dimension, frightening, transformative, and beyond our powers to imagine, and yet to be explored in the usual ways. We must send fearless experts, whatever that may come to mean, to explore and to report on what they find. Fearless experts, not just healthy volunteers, advanced skill set development, so they, they don't freak out in the experience. And how do you actually train for that? I think that we do that with cannabis. But a big question people are asking us is, is this interstate real? You know, like objectively real, other, other than something happening in my brain. I've talked about this in other places, and, um, and so has Dr. Gallimore. Rick Strassman's written a few books on it. Uh, but ethically speaking, I think we should consider the possibility that it might be real and engage the research like that. And the reason, the, the best story I have, I was talking to Rick about this, and I think he wrote about this in Spirit Molecule. I think it's, it's been a while since I've read that book. Uh, but he said the biggest surprise uh, that he got from his original research was that everybody described it as more real than real. It was like more real than real. Who believes, who has had that experience, right? I sure as hell have, right? But he described one experience where somebody came out of it and said that he had been raped by an entity in the experience. Uh, and he said, Rick Stred, he said, what did he say? I thought it was a nightmare, and then I realized it wasn't. <laughs> Can you imagine? Um, I think there might be ways to mitigate things like that and creating ritual around it, um, intention, prayer, right, other safety protocols that are outside of the sitting there giving somebody DMT and see what happens. Uh, and so I think we need to consider the possibility that it really might be real, engage it as that. Okay. I've talked a little bit about this, but for me, the trans cannabis work and the extended state DMT work represents opposites. Uh, large scale trauma for purpose, DMT is more of a, an experience, an exploration, something that we can envision and be inspired by. Kind of like the Mars missions and Elon Musk and things. So what is extended state DMT? This is the paper that started all of this. It's to use an anesthesia machine, put DMT through it so that you get a constant flow of the medicine in your system, so you don't come out of it. There's no tolerance for DMT. So the best way to describe it is, here's the typical DMT experience. This is from uh, that paper. The blue represents the peak, the breakthrough part of it. You can see it on the average, it's seven minutes or so. This is extended state DMT. It doesn't quite show up. This is that blue area and the other one, this is this area right here. So you come into it and you just can stay in it. This is theoretically, nobody has ever done this before. That's another reason I like this. So the question is, what would happen if we were able to do that? And the thing is, we don't know. I love that. To give you an idea, people have asked, well, what about ayahuasca? Can't you just take ayahuasca? This is... This right here, this line right here, is the peak of an ayahuasca experience of the, of, the, of the DMT in the blood, according to Dr. Gallimore. I need to check that, but I'm assuming he really cited that well. So we would be staying, keeping, inducing a peak that's five times stronger than an ayahuasca experience. And theoretically, you can extend it out for days. I don't know if anybody would want to do that right away, but... <laughs> <laughs> Ask Dr. Gall or Dr. Strassman how long he'd like to stay in it. I was thinking a couple of hours, he would say, and he said a couple of days. <laughs> so, 
There are many crazy people in this work, including myself. But it's so new, we get to name it. Uh, I really like cyber DMT, but I realized it was a little too sensational. I'm a role player. I loved role playing games when I was a kid. Extended state DMT is where we landed. And then continuous infusion study is what Dr. Strassman describes it as. And then for shorthand, we call it DMTX. Because extended state DMT is a really long word for like emails and websites and stuff. So the hypothesis for extended state DMT research is I don't want one really. I, I, I want it to be an exploratory study. So we're gonna, one, it, like maybe, can it be safely administered? Uh, how long can it be administered for? You know, how intensely, you know? But we'll do a lot of assessments before and after and see what happens to the person. Um, you know, personality-wise, mental health-wise, all of these things, and see what, see what comes out of it. But the real, real curiosity for me is understanding the human potential. My personal hypothesis is that we're already have a capacity to higher dimensionally perceive, and that we wouldn't be able to do it with DMT if we didn't have that capacity already. So what can we do with that state is the big question. And I could go into ideas, but I want to make sure we get through all of this. So our approach would be that it's congruent with scientific inquiry, but it's also congruent with the identity of the psychedelic community. It inspires us. We're not, we don't have to throw away our identity to have science step in. It's honoring of spiritual beliefs. It doesn't mean we have to believe them. Right? So it might mean somebody prepares for a DMT experience by prayer or meditation or having an altar in the room. And that we provide substance, substantive psychological support. And I add this again because people think that we're just going to be talking to aliens and all of that. That we really, we don't have to create a, a, a research program to say we're going to see if we can talk to aliens. Right? But that's very, I'm very curious about that. But again, we want it to be congruent with Western science. This is Dr. Gallimore and Dr. Strassman. I'm pretty sure Dr. Gallimore thinks I'm crazy at this point, but uh, he talks about aliens a lot. Dr. Strassman talks about, uh, you know, like uh, uh, the Torah and, alien and angels, right? So we're in good company. But this is the person I want to introduce you to. This is our principal investigator, Dr. Carla Clemens. She, this is her giving a speech at Psychedelic Shine when we had Dennis McKenna come. Uh, and she described herself in the speech as a radical lesbian feminist separatist therapist. <laughs> I had to look up what feminist separatist meant, you know. So I think she's, I think she's mellowed out a little bit, uh, or we wouldn't be talking. Um, <laughs> But we're really trying to break this mold of all white male, older white men being in charge of these programs in the North, the, the mental, you know, the co solely cognitive, while still having very credentialed people, you know. Uh, and and she's, a, she's the principal investigator, so she's the top dog, right? So it's not, you know, it's not something that we hold lightly. Okay, I'm almost done. So the fearless experts. What does that mean? Not just healthy volunteers. And so we want to play with the idea that we're going to try to work with people who are on the gifted end of the spectrum. Trauma has an has a unfortunate capacity to throw people into this spectrum, into the negative. But healed trauma has the capacity to open up the gifted side even more. Right? It's called that post-traumatic growth. So, so we're, we're trying to figure out how to um, engage people and train them to, to experience this in a safe way, right? This is the room. I hope to be this person. But I, I, I'm, a, I'm not sure what will happen when the FDA and all those guys get a hold of it. Um, it'll probably have to be in a hospital but I would love to have it in a research or in a retreat center. So that means we'd have to bring some of the hospital gear with us. And then this is one of my favorite parts, AI. Like this is happening. You know, this is not science fiction. And then that it would be part of a training program. 
So some people would be in the room just holding space and witnessing it. Also, having this many, what do we, what do we describe it as? Um, electromagnetic fields in the room, human beings around it, might offer a layer of protection from energetic intrusions like that guy experienced. So this is our like kind of a holding page right now, dmtx.org. Um, you can also email me at dmtx at medicinalmindfulness.org. You know, so we're not recruiting volunteer psychonauts, but I've gotten about 200 requests already. Um, so our goal is to create a training manual, you know, as a possible um, fundraiser too, you know, and, and also teach people skill sets of how to use these medicines with safety and highest potential for success, depending on what you want your twi in, uh, intention to be. And we're also wanting that DMTX just inspires the idea of science fiction stories and science fiction art. So we want to create ideas, of, you know, pe bring people in to start thinking, what would it be like? What would be the implications of it? not be super attached to having it be fully grounded in fact, uh, just because it would be fun. And there's a lot of books and movies uh, with these themes, the Matrix, we've seen Flatliners, uh, Interstellar, you know, there are, it's already out there, Kurt Vonnegut or Philip K. Dick. Um, but we're, we're working to develop the organizational structure now. There's some really big questions that we're that we're working on. We've got this fundraising media team starting to happen. Carla's working on the steering committee for the protocol. And then the training manual is where we're at. So our goal is to raise 25 to 50K for this first round, just so we can get some of the preliminary stuff figured out. And we can see that coming from one person or small donations from everybody. You know, uh, we just keep living into the possibility that it's happening and we keep getting met by others who want to make it happen too. So it's a, to me, the experiment is trusting the medicine, trusting the process. Can we do something in the real world that seems impossible, but inspired by this medicine? When I, uh, in 2009, the first Psychedelic Sciences Conference, I saw Rick Doblin speak, and he described it as we're butterflies merging from the cocoon instead of just a few butterflies. This was in the beginning when psychedelic sciences was really taking off. Um, that there were just a few butterflies and now there's thousands. But as we step into this work, we have to practice and skill sets, learn how to fly. The other thing that I would like to name is that we also have to learn how to fail repeatedly again and again and again and be okay with that because each of these failures uh, we learn something important and significant uh, and that it's a transformational process in and of itself that we that we that we can't jump from being a individual psychonaut to engaging in psychedelic society uh, with grace and ease all the time right and so I would like to invite you all to not only explore these questions that we're posing, trans cannabis and DMT, extended state DMT, but what is your calling in this? How do you want the medicine to work for you instead of you working for the medicine? And then go out and try it. Um, and fail. And then stand back up and do it again. <laughs> Learn from these experiences. This is how we manage to get as far as we have uh, by experimenting, by doing research, by living into it. So again, I'm, I'm just out of a new metamorphosis cocoon. I'm, I'm moving my wings around trying to get them to work. And this is what I've come up with so far. So this is my, these are my expedition notes. I'm really curious to hear what kind of questions you have. And I'd like to thank you again for inviting me into your community to, to share what we've been up to in Boulder. So thank you very much.
Yeah, go over to that. That's fine. Yeah, so I think we have some time for some questions. Is that what we're going to do? And then um, I'm supposed to kind of summarize or repeat back for the, for the videos and things. Um, did you have a question? Can you sort of explain what a, how trans cannabis experience typically happens? What, what yeah, sure. Uh, so again, we're working that four paradigm approach. So uh, we come together uh, and I explain how to do the works, you know, like the practice. Um, and check in, we create intentions together. I do a meditation to create an intention uh, for each person. And then uh, everybody, uh, we take a break, I fill pipes or people bring their own cannabis. What we found is that uh, we don't even need to provide the cannabis for people to have psychedelic experiences. Although, you know, I've been working with the medicine for a while now intentionally and I've learned really specific ways to tweak it. But it's a full, we call it a full spectrum cannabis experience. So it has strong indicas to strong sativas and some really important hybrids in the middle there. And they would all be taken specifically at different times? So what we do after, after a break, everybody sits in a circle and we do what we call a gratitude prayer. And there's seven opportunities to imbibe, uh, to smoke in and, and about five to seven minutes. So and the medicine is ground up. So it's about the equivalent of two or three bowls in one bowl. And everybody has their own pipe so that, you know, so they can get the, as much as they need. And then they're invited to smoke as little. So zero, one hit, all the way to 10 or more. And we have people that come, uh, you know, smoke pretty large amounts. Um, then everybody lays down in a circle in Savasana, their hands on, gently on their hearts, eye covering on. And I guide people through a body scan meditation to help them kind of integrate and transition to an altered state. And what, what, one of the great things we found is that we can, cannabis creates what's called a visual proprioception. So it creates a synesthesia between our visual capacity and our ability to feel our bodies. And so we can actually see inside our bodies. And so you see the tension, you watch it melt away, you clear it, you see the energy moving through your system. Uh, and then we let the music take over. So music would be in the south, you know, the medicine wheel, the art, creative, creative play and things. And so we use uh, gentle music, evocative music, um, rhythmic music, uh, music from soundtracks and things uh, to induce a, make sure I didn't unplug that, to induce a, um, like the landscape, the inner landscape that people travel in. It evoke, evokes emotion, evokes memory. And then it evokes transpersonal elements to meetings with guides, flying through the cosmos, experiencing past lives, that sort of thing. Uh, the longer sessions have a break in the middle. So people, at any time, if you're feeling bored, I tell you, you didn't smoke enough. So sit back up, <laughs> smoke some more. You know, you really want to, you know, it's like what Terrence McKenna said, you want to get to that point where you smoked way too much. <laughs> But the blend is designed to reduce the anxiety of the sativas and reduce the sleepiness of the indica. So you're just really lit, you know, instead of having like the uh, extreme anxiety of uh, like taking too much of an edible, for instance. So it's more of a psychedelic experience. What I tell people, I can't guarantee a good one, a good experience because this is psychedelic, but we can guarantee a pretty profound one at this point. Um, so the music plays for a couple hours with a break maybe in the middle and then I gently guide people back and then we sh circle up and share the experience and uh, um, have some snacks and everybody goes home. This is one of the gifts of this medicine. I thought the short duration was a limitation more than anything when we first got started because I was coming from facilitating eight hour journeys, right? Uh, but what we found is these shorter experiences, they're super evocative, but there's, they're not overwhelming with content. So you can integrate them into your lives and clear, you know, you're not overwhelmed by all the traumatic experience you have to relive in a healing environment. You can just do it piece by piece by piece, right? Um, so that's, that's the experience with cannabis. Yeah. Would your musical playlist for that experience be, let's say, similar to the music that they would play at a Groff uh, holotropic breathwork yeah. training? 
Yeah, not quite as intense. Uh, yeah, yeah. So we don't have to, you know. So our breathwork practice is, you know, more intense music. Our breathwork, we actually use live music, which is really great. We have a, uh, a band called Nabumbu that plays with us, plays for us. It's two guys. They play ryth rhythm and synth, you know. Um, so it's really evocative. Um, yeah. yeah. A lot of times in the, in the hall of chop, have my experience with it. It's, it's, it's uh, there's quite an emotional release. Yeah. Where out the people right away go into a cathartic. Yeah. Yeah. Brings that up. This wouldn't quite be on that level, maybe. Would you expect people to burst into tears? Like oh, yeah. Movie? Yeah, and people shake, like in uh, holotropic breathwork. So people will be laying there and, and shaking. And that's like clearing the trauma out of their bodies. So it's a, it is, though, we don't, we don't recommend that people talk much or because or, requi the cannabis requires a very gentle, quiet, pre and still presence. So a lot of movement and things. It's more being in savasana. It's holding still and turning inward is the thing that we skip the most. So that's the, what we promote the most in our program. The music would be a little more. Like it kind of ebbs and flows. Reflective. Yeah, and I make the sets as as we go. Um, you know, so I'm following the energy of the experience. So if somebody, you know, if we need a big big journey's music, I've got it all. And if we need. People are having a tough time, and we don't need to evoke them anymore. We, you know, we play crystal bowls and gentle oming. You know, with multiple people in the room, wouldn't they possibly be on different paths and be different? Well, an energetic field is a collective energetic field is created. So that's what I'm reading. I'm not reading. I'm making sure individuals are staying safe and not overwhelmed by their experience because that can happen. Um, but I'm more reading the energy of the of the circle. So it's one energy that's created. And people talk about feeling the energy of the room, supporting them and, and their own process. And, and you can see it. You can see it bouncing around the, around the room. Even in movements, it'll start to, people will start to reflect and mirror each other in their subtle body movements. Yeah? Even so, is there individual communication with the facilitator and the participant from time to time? Or? Uh, only if they request support and help. It's more of a, uh, so the, the question is there individual uh, communication with the facilitator uh, and um, or is it interactive uh, the cannabis sessions are more inward journey um, but if somebody raises their hand or we ask people to raise a finger so it's we know it's real explicit we'll go over there take gently take their hand and check in on them and it's usually a blanket or some water or an energetic support holding their shoulder put a hand on the shoulder or putting hands on their feet for grounding, things like that. But it's not an interactive experience. It's not therapeutic in that way. We just use therapeutic, mostly somatically oriented therapeutic processes to elicit uh, deep altered states work. So the therapy is actually in the structure of it, not in the, in, in the individual engaging. Yeah, yeah, in the back. So is there, a, is there any breath work in this? Or is that something so yeah, so this is the kind of the metamorphosis that's happening. Uh, so with the cannabis work, you don't really need a big breath work practice to induce the altered state. So we let it be gentle and relaxing. But there is a circular, gentle breathing that you can incorporate into an intentional cannabis practice. That's like um, I like to breathe in through the nose, and you know, a gentle like an exhaling sigh and make it circular, so no pauses. And so that's enough to really amplify the cannabis experience. But what we're doing is we've developed a second blend of this trans-cannabis idea that's more for breath work. So it has a lot of CBD in it, a lot of indicas for pain management. Because I don't know if you've experienced breath work, but it can be incredibly painful to get the tetany in the hands or cramping in the body. And then it has a high note sativa to keep the energy. So if you had all indicas and CBD, people wouldn't be able to hold it. You know, they'd fall asleep or something. Uh, so we, we add a sativa to keep them active. And what we're doing, what we're seeing there is extremely psychedelic experiences with cathartic releases like uh, holotropic breathwork. But they're not required to do the like the ongoing forceful breath the whole time. What seems to be happening is they'll do it for 10 minutes or so, and then they'll f fly through the you know, cosmos for a while, 
they'll catch their body again, catch the breath we're practicing in, really get that engine revving and then shoot off again. And, and so that seems to be, a, it seems to be a different cycle that's induced when you add cannabis to a breathwork experience. Yeah? I'm curious, have you seen in like, uh, say, uh, psychonauts have had uh, profound experiences on other substances, say it's powerful as like 5-MeO or uh, really high state of DMT, if this will reactivate those states as well? So the question is, will the can cannabis experience reactivate other psychedelic experiences like DMT, 5-MeO, DMT? Yes. Yeah, the, the most common experience is it's like ayahuasca is what we get. And so particularly ayahuasca practitioners who have that doorway open, they're able to access it easier with cannabis. Um, like a 5-MeO experience isn't that common, but you know, it, uh, going into a profound you know, uh, dissolving bliss state definitely can happen. But again, one of the gifts of cannabis is you have a little more agency than these other medicines. So, in the yeah. work, are you trying to, are you trying to do some hypoxia or anything like that in addition, or is it just simply breath work? Yeah. Um, well, I think that's, it can be a natural part of any breath work, um, but it's, it's, uh, it's not, the breath isn't as in, so the, the question is hypoxia and breath work and, uh, um, It seems like there's an important part of it with regular breath work that, that I would say, you know, the um, getting extra CO2 in the body is, seems to be part of the breath work experience and what induces it. Uh, what we're finding with the cannabis is that it seems to reduce the need of some of the extreme practices of breath work to get to the same place. So it might reduce some of these, these pieces. This is very new area that we're, we're just now stepping into. So that's been my experience so far, is that it reduces a lot of, it, when the CBD strains seem to reduce a lot of the extreme emotional pain that can come with, or, or physical pain that can come with regular breath work. So. All right, so thank you again everybody for having me in LA, I really appreciate it. <laughs> Hope you got something out of this. Thank you so much, Daniel. Yeah. True visionary. Um, so we'll just have a few announcements before we move into our musical uh, artistic portion of the evening. Uh, some events that are coming up, the next uh, Psychedelic Integration Circle will be happening in Santa Monica this coming Monday from uh, 6 to 8 p.m. at Kathmandu Boutique on Lincoln Boulevard. Uh, and then we have another Integration Circle happening on Sunday uh, in Mar Vista, just across the street from here. And the next AWARE Project event will happen in downtown at the All Act restaurant. And we have a, a, um, an ayahuasca medicine uh, center founder coming in from Peru, the founder of Ayaruna Medicine Center. Uh, his name is Javier Aguero. He's coming all the way from there to promote a new book that he wrote about ayahuasca and another one about San Pedro, Wachuma and he will be uh, presenting a talk about uh, his ways of working with the plants. And then two days later, he will be giving a hands-on workshop, a, um, a workshop as part of the Shamanic Practices series here in Santa Monica about plant diets. So if anyone is interested about learning more about uh, plant diets, then it will be a good place to come learn about them. And then, uh, what else? We have one more event coming up next week. Uh, about integration through yoga. So we have two members of our community, Dr. Dario Nardi, who is a, a personality specialist and a neuroscientist who will be talking about the aspects of yoga from a Jungian aspect and how they affect the brain and the chakras. And then we have a yoga specialist. Is he here tonight? Joel, are you here? You didn't make it. Okay, um, who at, um, he's a, a Kundalini yoga teacher who will be teaching about the methods of psychedelic integration through yoga practice. So we have the theory behind the integration through yoga as well as the practice itself. And that will happen in Santa Monica next Thursday on the 24th. And all these events, by the way, they're all listed on our Facebook pages. So if you go to this event's webpage, you'll find both the Aware Project webpage 
as well as the Psychedelic Coach webpage, and you can just subscribe to the events and get updates straight into your uh, event Facebook inbox. Uh, and we have also Brad here that's going to make a quick announcement about a special project that's coming up. If you want to come up, Brad, and introduce the project. Yeah, I'm Brad Adams. I run a group called Lamps. Uh, it's another group in LA. It's um, kind of similar to this. We have more um, scientific speakers, just as a, as a rule. And it's the first Sunday of every month. Usually, next time one's going to be September 10th, and Ben's going to be one of the speakers. I don't know if you them, but yeah, we'll talk there. Uh, so if you want to sign up for that, there's a sheet over there. You can sign up and get on the list. Uh, also, we're doing a Kickstarter program right now for MB5, and uh, it's for Martin Ball's work with uh, 5 Amino DMT. We're, trying, we're going to do a documentary about it. Uh, we just interviewed a bunch of people. We're, so the goal is to take five people to Jamaica and have him um, do his technique with the 5 Amino, going to collect scientific data on these five people. So we have two, two weeks left to raise like 25,000 bucks. So. We really need to get the word out. Uh, I have a bunch of these little flyers with the Kickstarter website on there and the MV5, and there's a lot more back there if uh, anyone's interested in that. And also, as uh, some of you might know, I think uh, there have been announcements here about the conference in February. We're going to do a psychedelic conference, first ever psychedelic conference in LA uh, in several decades. Uh, it's going to be at USC, and it'll be February, I believe, 17th and 18th, so keep that on your radar. If anyone wants to be part of the planning committee for that, we're trying to get that uh, up and going again. So that's it. Awesome. Thank you. Thanks, Brian. First psychedelic conference in LA in decades. Is that big or what? It's maybe going to put up, put us on the map a little bit more than we already are. Um, all right. So before we have Jade, is Jade here? Ready to go? Okay, cool. So I want to again thank everyone for coming tonight. Spread the word, like our Facebook page, invite your friends, let's keep, let's keep this community growing and fresh and uh, introduce them to this amazing work. Um, the word of mouth, as you know, is the best way of advertising and, uh, and uh, enlarging our community. And I want to thank the amazing volunteers that has, have made this evening possible because we could not do this without um, all these beautiful energies coming together to produce this event. So we have uh, thank, I want to thank TJ, Emerson, Malia, Lena, and Jean, and uh, Paul, who's filming the event for us tonight. And uh, any other volunteers here that we missed? No? Perfect. Well, thank you so much. Again, we couldn't have done this without you. And uh, well, I'm going to introduce the musical guests now. And after the, the musical portion, please stay here and mingle and connect and exchange business cards and speak to someone that you don't know and again just stay connected make connections um and yeah let's keep this community thriving eat strawberries eat strawberries <laughs> eat a, a piece of broccoli <laughs> thanks so um so i would like to introduce to you our art art, art artist for the evening the uh, radiant jade quinn is a Los Angeles native and homelessness relief worker. Her writing includes poetry, prose, and hybrid forms. She is also an art model and a photographer. A graduate of the Jack Kerouac School of Disembodied Poetics at Naropa University in Boulder, Colorado, also from Boulder. Her writing and photography has been featured in Fields, Metatron, Heavy Athletics, Be Oink, and more. Accompanying Jay tonight is uh, Patrick Pierce, a Los Angeles-based recording artist, composer, and musician. He is the frontman of the Little Band of Gold. So, Jay, the stage is all yours. Hi there. Thank you so much for having me. And Daniel, that was an amazing talk. I did not know coming here tonight that Daniel was from Boulder, and we actually attended the same school, Naropa University. I'm not surprised that we found each other here tonight. In addition, um, in addition, this is my first time reading outside of Boulder, actually. So poetry has been an immense force in my life. It's been the most powerful force in my life. 
and it is such an honor for you guys to be here with me. I've, I'm working on a new project. This will be my first time reading from it, and it has been very transformative thus far. So this is the perfect venue and the perfect transition to beginning reading in Los Angeles. Thank you. The ghost is on the wire. The ghost is on the wire. Pink stucco walls meet the dry dirt. A cold front enters the valley. Tender face, a war heavy like a pebble dropping into still waters. Folds overlap, bodies pushing together grasping for spirit, finding only the ghost, but searching anyway. My life is perfect with you, I choke. Words splattering the page. The bars were a hologram, now they're iron. The shadow's name is doubt. The water will run clean, I want to promise you. I will drum on the rocks until it runs clean. In the ether, there we sleep, intertwined in a god realm. Mississauga. A well, a pit, billows loose matter. Water below the interior left to ferment like lips sewn shut. I bury myself in poems. Each line is the spindle. I'm the wire curling myself around it. He told me he is free. I scoffed mostly in envy. A dick might keep me happy for a day. Then the night comes and I want something better to chew on. A poem, a crystal, a moon or something equally luminous. He calls himself an addict. This pleased me. Attraction and submission. Suspended on a meat hook. My skull is an egg cracked open on the sidewalk. Tripping over an edge, no U-turns. My bed smelled like him. I wore his scent like a smoky room. A husk is the real human. The real human is sealed up tight, preserved in the frost between strangers. Who brought the storm? Shrugs become tumbleweeds I swerve to avoid. The drought is over. El Nino fixed us in one season. We hold our mouths the same as though amphibious. It flooded in Boulder. And crawfish spill down the mountain ready for a fight. When the tide carried me away, the girl inside me died. I still can't get around to burying her. There are ashes on my mantle, cigarettes, Palo Santo, an ashen corpse. Two words never faded, scribbled on my wrist over shallow scars. I arose with my heart and stomach filled to the brim in fear of waking. The start of a new day, a chemical purple, a haze that lingers around every step and pull closer to the next dusk. Oven mitts. This one's one of my favorites. His seams are sewn tight, that quality and collar labels. 
like the meals we go Dutch on. I empty my pockets for his company. She hand wrote, you like the arches of my feet. In a pocket, poet Hal covered in watercolor, the type of thing only a lover creates. My affections grow dusty. I tug at the seams, invite him to play with my insides. He once caught me reading, proceeded with short sentences, eye contact, more glare than adoration. The fracture ends to the bone. He backs into the light, so stealthily, erects chain links.
I'm a vegetarian unless angels are on the menu. Mouth-watering, deep-fried wings shove greasy bones in their trumpets. The cost of scorn is often unexpected. I see my fascist neighbor from downstairs. Did my boyfriend and I make too much noise last night? His glare, the yes that keeps me smiling. And then I'm gonna finish up with two old ones. Um, I have not performed this in very long, but they're very meaningful to me. Poker face, as if emotion is absorbed through eyes. Or was I just sleeping? Or did I forget warmth? Stone can never be transparent as glass, translucent and reflective like crystal. Sometimes I move slow slower, growing ever so slow. And you grow tired and I cry, wake up, wake up, wake up for me. I'm Sandy by birth, Sandy by stars. And I'm sorry I'm so Sandy, but it never washes away. Bottom, bottom dweller, sea muck. Smells like low tide. Smells like Venetian bayou. The rot of sadness. Time again, visit spaces enclosed. Small eyes peered, cockeyed, with short reach, hesitant hand, claw like grasping, and empty always. Jesus and Buddha's names. 
I invited archangels. I was not alone. I was protected. They made sure the lines of salt didn't fall into the carpet. They even bathed with me, though we hardly fit. Sometimes they would just stand, feet submerged. Thank you. Thank you most of all to our incredible speaker, Daniel McQueen from Boulder, for making this a mindfulness.